Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual event with Mysterious Galaxy. I am Nick, the director of events for the store. Today, we are welcoming Lavi Tidar as his next book, Neom, is coming out or has come out. Hello, Lavi. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, in conversation, we have Summit Basu. Hello, Summit. Hi. Uh, Lavi is the British is a British science fiction, British fantasy, and world fantasy award winning author. Uh, he is also an acclaimed author, literature, science fiction, fantasy, graphic novels, and middle grade fiction. Wonderful things to have under the belt. Conversation partner Summit is an Indian novelist. Uh, he has published several novels in a range of speculative genres, all critically acclaimed and best selling in India. Uh, his latest novel that dropped here in the States, uh, The City Inside, was shortlisted under its Indian name, Chosen Spirits, as a JCB Prize, India's biggest literary award. Um, if you have any questions you would like to ask the authors, you can submit them underneath the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you would like to purchase any copies, uh, Lavie's or Summit's books, you can click the link below. They'll take to our website and we ship across the world as well as across the country. Uh, I will be back at the end of the program, but uh, I'm gonna leave it to these two authors to talk more about their books and about themselves. I hope to see you all later in the program. Thank you so much, Nick, for hosting us. Um, so, hi everyone. I was so excited when I, uh, when I heard I would be getting to have a chat with Levy. Um, who is one of my favorite authors. And I, and I say that with no strings attached, like no office generation, no office genre. He's just one of the best people to do it. Um, so I was so excited that I completely forgot what time zone I live in. So it's uh, 2.30 a.m. here. And as a result of this, if you see me at any point of time during this looking like a little less than fully awake, it's just the R. It's not uh, one of my favorite authors, and it's not the wonderful book that he's written, which is Neom. Um, Neom, which is a tough book to describe because it's it's a science fiction novel. It's not it's not super long, and it flows super smoothly and super gently for something that is absolutely packed with story. I was trying to describe it to a friend of mine today, and I ended up sounding like an incoherent child because I was saying, so there's the city, it's in the desert, it's in the future, there's a robot, it buys a flower, it finds a mysterious thing, there's a wonderful couple, um, there's, she sells the robot, the flower, this man is a policeman, they have a thing, there's a boy who wants to go to space, there's a terror artist who's very scary and has unfinished business, and they all converge on this amazing city in the desert, and they all have un unfinished business, and there's this grand world-changing event which may or may not happen. So, Levi, I want to, after that terrible introduction to your book, I want to start off asking you, um, where did this come from? What was the what was the story? Um, how did you write this? Tell us. I was actually just uh, trying to read the titles of the books behind you on the shelf. As you, I'm talking. Um, no, I mean, you know, I mean, it was the it was the pandemic. Basically, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be writing this book. I was supposed to be writing this serious novel, which I have no copy of, but um, this serious novel called Maraud, which is, you know, uh, like 150,000 word epic historical, you know, look at 40 years of Israeli, sort of the underbelly of Israeli society and all that. And then the second lockdown hit in the UK and uh, it was too late to get away. Like, I knew it was coming, and I knew if I leave like right now, I could get away from it. But they refused to admit that it was coming, and so and it was like December, which is not my favorite time of year to be in England at the best of times. And it was just depressing. It was just depressing through a three months lockdown, and just just to stay sane. I thought, you know, well, I'll just do a bit of science fiction instead of this epic historical thing. I just couldn't concentrate on it at all. So I literally, I just had the image of a robot holding a flower. And I wrote this chapter that ended up not quite being the first chapter in the book. Um, and the robot just shows up at this marketing, buys a flower, and goes off to the desert. 
and then it leaves the flower in the desert. And it really doesn't doesn't have much action. It's not really Star Wars, is it? Um, and uh, and I finished it. I think at the end of it, the robot sort of kills a, a scorpion, and and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Why why did this robot kill the scorpion? That, that kind of put the whole the robot in a new light. You know, you kind of think, oh, there's there's something about this robot. So I wrote another thing to find out what the robot was doing, and it's sort of just digging something up in the in the desert. Um, and I was like, okay, I don't know why it's doing that. So so I kept writing, and then realized very quickly that I was actually writing a novel. And it you know, but it was it was literally just to get me through the second lockdown in the pandemic. Um, so I was very surprised. Like I wasn't even supposed to be writing it. It was basically taking a break from this proper proper book that I was supposed to be doing to write this book. And then, you know, the reviews have been really kind. And I just keep thinking, but it was, you know, it was just to pass the time. Well, I mean, it only happens to be this really brilliant book, which I congratulate you for doing an even worse job of selling it than I did in my incoherent description of it. <laughs> um, so, the, the uh, you know, so as I was reading it, now, I, I remember reading Central Station, I think it was a 2010 book, so I, I would have read it around then. And I remember loving it and it being very complicated, but uh, I was a bit worried when I started reading this because I didn't know how standalone it was. And of course, it, it ended up being purely standalone, though there's always this sense of, if I remembered every detail of Central Station, there would be additional layers. So I'll have to read Central Station again and all of that. But I wanted to ask you, so this this whole universe that, that you've created here, right? Um, everything that's happening on the other planets and the rest of the solar system, uh, the history of this world and all of that. Um, so tell us how this, you know, you started from a single image of this robot buying the flower and uh, placing it in the desert. Um, how did that integrate with this with this multi-directional universe that you've created and why neon well neon neon did start a bit early i mean there's two kind of elements that fed into the book and neon i sort of came across because i i go to egypt or i have gone to egypt over the past 20 i don't want to sound old so i'm going to cap it at 20 years you know um to, to the Red Sea, mostly, but both of the Sinai Peninsula. So I watched it change quite a bit and and to the Egyptian proper side sort of thing. And always looking at Saudi Arabia on the other side, which was not a country that was very welcoming um, <laughs> up until around now. I think it wasn't the sort of place you could go visit, really. Um, and, um, and at some point, like a few years ago, I came across the idea of Neom, which is short for Neo Mostakbal or New Future um, that they dreamed up. And they were like, we're going to build this city on the on the Red Sea. And the, all it had was a marketing video on YouTube. And uh, the, the images they had were like those, um, uh, the tropical gardens in Singapore. <laughs> that was... That was sort of what it was supposed to look like. And I thought that's that's kind of ridiculous, you know. So I thought that would be a good setting. And I wrote what became the first chapter of the novel, which was actually published in Asimov's as a short story initially. Um, and that's a lot. The problem was, I think, the, the story I wrote was much more contemporary. It was much more like our near future, you know, making fun of sort of tech optimism and all that sort of stuff. So in the book, it didn't quite feel like it was the same city. It needed to, you know, the city I was writing about was way, way further on in the future. But the weird thing about Neom, so they are actually building it. That's that's kind of the thing. And I uh, I was talking at uh, an event on Thursday, and someone came up to me afterwards and said they're, they're a civil engineer and they're looking at jobs in Neom. Apparently, it pays very, very well. And uh, so I'm glad I got that book done, you know, early <laughs> because in five years it's probably going to be, you know, it's going to be there. And and you can be Neom's first kind of poet laureate person, like the first person definitely to write a book before the city that it's about was built. Yeah, I'm definitely. Which, yeah, I'm definitely still waiting for the phone call from the the Saudi royal family to. Uh, 
extend extend the offer with ideally a very large check attached to it but i went <laughs> i went all my breath on it it is it is still the, the best kind of speculative income plan i've ever heard any writer have really like it couldn't have been better but i'm going to i'm going to head into a writing question now which is that you know when you're when you're doing this when you're when you're creating creating a story um in a universe that you've already worked in how how concerned were you about keeping it standalone and how organized are you about this like do you have your own little uh, inner kevin feige thing going on you know cataloging the various corners of your universe yeah i'm super not organized um i know people have like 40000 word bibles and all the rest of it i just make stuff up but i seem to remember most of it like occasionally i have to go and look i think the whole terrorist thing you know cuz i had this whole idea obviously one of my books was a summer which was all about you know terrorist attacks really um and it's that idea that terrorism is an act, it's a media you know it's done for the media it's not done it's not it's not a weapon of war it's a weapon of broadcasting you know and so i kind of got that idea of the terror artists as people who just do it for the art they don't do it for a political purpose but just because that's sort of their canvas um and i think to be honest um it was partly inspired because i was living in jakarta for a bit and um really hated jakarta i mean not the nicest city in the world so I think maybe that's what it came from. All right, nine million cars and no, not a single pavement. You know, it was that sort of thing. Um, no, so I remember most of it, and I think for the book, the, the, the editors has also asked me to kind of do an appendix with defining some of the terms from the wider world. So, so I, so I did it. I think the idea was it fills up some pages, basically, because they made me cut out a chapter I really liked. And then said, now the book is so short. And and I said, well, put the chapter back in. And they were like, no, but can you do, you know, can you do an appendix instead? <laughs> so fine. But yeah, I, I, did, I did the math on it the other day. And there's about 200,000 words of just a short story set in this wider universe. Plus Central Station, Neom. Um, Martian Sands, which is sort of in it, and then an unpublished novel that I kind of been cannibalizing for for years, you know, for material. Um, yeah, but you know, every time I think I kind of lose interest, I find something new, or you know, there's there's so I mean, this, the solar system is huge, Earth is huge, so as long as you can find something interesting, it's just very easy. You just kind of fall back into it and you just throw in a few references here and there um, to things that only you care, you know, only you remember or care about. So, but how did you, okay, so first of all, I'm, I'm sorry in advance that you will not be getting a check from Jakarta. Um, so you'll have to make do with uh, your <laughs> Neom one. Um, but so, you know, when you're doing, when you're doing this, how do you how do you decide what to leave out? Because you know, when I was looking at each of the story tracks that you have here with each of these characters, they're all novel protagonists, right? And you're you're packing in so much world and so many layers and you know so many references to things where even if they're articulated in other stories, I don't need to know that whole story when I'm reading this because you're just informing character. But was there a temptation to just make this a 250,000 word novel where you fleshing out all of these character stories or if not, I mean, what, what how did you keep it so short? Well, firstly, let me apologize to the of Jakarta, but I think everyone who lives in Jakarta <laughs> kind of shares, everyone who lives there shares the same feeling about the city. I mean, it's, you know, and on the weekend, everyone leaves the city to go to the highlands. So the highlands are just full of everyone from Jakarta getting out of the city anyway it was an interesting place i i got you know i did some writing i got some writing done there um i completely forgot the question now um how me. did you decide what it's how also to leave things over up. here by the way. yeah i mean i just don't like info dumps you know and i think no i never want to write a long novel i mean i didn't want to write a novel at all having written <laughs> this came you know came as a as a major surprise to me 
I hate writing novels. Um, so, but it's, you know, I don't, I don't believe in, I hate info dumps as a reader, you know, I hate when people explain stuff to me. And a lot of it doesn't really matter. You know, all that really matters is having a few little details. And I love that style. And I think it's from uh, Cordwainer Smith that really kind of did that. There was a writer back in the 60s in American science fiction um, that he would he would do that. He would tell you about stuff that you have no idea what it is, you know, about these fabulous sort of aliens and all kinds of mysterious stuff. And he would just mention it in passing. And it was up to you to figure out you know, from context or to go and hunt down the story where that stuff gets expanded on and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, for me, the central station universe is, A, all the stuff that I've been making up, but a lot of it is just homage to classic science fiction that I sort of just grew up on and, and like. And a lot of early science fiction people don't really read that much anymore, you know, which I think is a shame. But I think it's also... You know, it's interesting, you know, when I talk to you and it's interesting, like when I've been writing the the review column for the Washington Post with Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, that we grew up in completely separate parts of the world. You know, she grew up in Mexico City. Um, I grew up on a kibbutz in Israel. I was reading American SF in translation. I think she was kind of picking up English language paperbacks from secondhand shops. But we like the same stuff, and it's such a weird thing. They're like, we're both Roger, big Roger Zelazny fans, you know? And it's somehow this language of science fiction kind of spread out around the world and found these nerdy, weird kids in various corners yeah. of the earth. And now we talk to each other <laughs> on the internet, which is kind of weird. So for the so a lot of the references in the books are just kind of you know, throw away references. I just steal from people that people who are dead, essentially. That's they become. But you know, people like Roger Zelazny, Larry Niven, obviously people still read Niven, but um um Clifford Simak, you know, who I absolutely loved, and I don't think people really read him that much. And he's got a big influence. He was a very gentle writer, he was a very interesting writer, and all these philosophical robots and Things like the mansion yaggers, you know, the man hunters, which I think were just these giant robots who hunted people. Um, so a lot of it, but I like to acknowledge the reference. I don't want people to think I'm just stealing. So it's always kind of signposted very clearly that it's a, it's a loving reference rather than, uh, <laughs> you know, theft. <laughs> Well, but, you know, and this actually leads straight into what I wanted to ask you next, which is that, um, so your, your robot here, for instance, right? Uh, very classic robot, uh, thinks about the laws of robotics, but is a killing machine himself. So, um, so I, I love that, that contradiction. And was that, I mean, it's, I, I don't know if I'm articulating this right, but it feels like the the challenge of a love for classic science fiction, um, you know, clashing with with the with the realities of present day life. To which, you know, what do you think of where SF is now? Um, what um, is is there, you know, um, and especially as the editor of of Best of World SF, um, now heading towards Volume Three, I believe, um, is there you know, if, if you had unlimited resources and could bring back more classic things and mix them up, what would your ideal mix be? God, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been, I am trying to. I mean, I'm kind of like at the point where I've been going around saying to people, you know, give me money so I can have my own imprint and I can pick the books I want and then I can publish all the weird classics that no one remembers anyone you know circus world that's a that's an interesting example it's a it's a spaceship crewed by a circus and they crash on a planet and no one comes to rescue them so they build an entire society based on the circus which is the most ridiculous concept but it's such a fun book that i think you know it's an unjustly neglected sort of classic science fiction novel so there's a lot of that around. Well, I think we're losing a lot of the quirk. We're losing a lot of the weird, 
difficult stuff because we're so focused on commercial buzzwordy you know hashtag and big you know and science fiction isn't good at when it's big it's it needs to be small it needs to be tight so i think we're losing that or if we're not losing it i think that little stuff goes to the little presses rather than to the big publishers who can push it and i've seen that because again having done this review column for three years i i'm very well aware of the amount of PR emails we were getting were not particularly interesting to me or to Sylvia. Um, they were just, you know, you know, movie meets TV show in space. I think that was kind of what well, we were getting quite a lot of. Um, yeah. What, what was the per first part of your question? It was... I've I've completely forgotten now, but it was it was also yeah, I mean, me too. But it was oh, the robots. No, yeah, I wanted yeah. to say something about the robots because yeah. because you know it's ridiculous because this whole book is about robots. It's like <laughs> I have this theory that as long as you do a book with a spaceship or a robot on the cover, you're okay. You know, every now and then, just because all around the world there are people who just like the book with either a spaceship or a robot on the cover. Um, you know, in every country, there's that one publisher that will just do spaceship on the cover books. So it's like a foolproof method of getting getting your novels sold um, around the world. But no, yeah, the the robots. I kind of put all the science fiction, all the classic science fiction robots into the book. You know, so yeah. I think it started. I think it started with a short story I did um, called In Xanadu, which is set on Titan. I think it was published at Tor. There's this robot that shows up. And that robot kind of believes in the three laws of robotics from Isaac Asimov. But he, he believes in them as, a, as an ideal. He thinks that's, that's a pretty neat thing to do. But my job is to kill people, as you said. So, I, But I kind of like the idea of following these laws. And uh, and I thought that was funny, <laughs> for one thing. But also because robots today, you know, robots are not humanoid. I think the only hum humanoid robots we get are either built to show off or they're really des designed to be, you know, companions to old people. I think that's kind of the idea that they're going towards, is medical ro robots or companion robots or sex robots, God help us. Um and um, and I just like the idea of humanoid robots in general because they are so pointless, you know. So the robots we really have today, they either build cars in factories or they kill people in war, right? They drones and mine layers and so on. So so the, that's, that's what we use robots for. So it makes sense to write about robots who kill people, you know, and kind of maybe don't love the idea or try to get away from it. But it's also a way of then saying some interesting contemporary stuff about veterans and wars and what happens when the wars end and so on. So, so you know, when uh, when you were writing Maror, um, you were tweeting a lot about, you know, escaping the confines of genre and moving to a fancier, posher literary fiction life. And you, you've written, and you have, of course, written this book that, you know, that I've, I've seen, I mean, Neom is getting immense praise as well, but so did Maror. So I wanted to ask you a two-part question. One is, are those fancy litvic people really treating you that much better than science fiction people is part one. And part two <laughs> is, how do we keep you? Like, I mean, clearly, you're, clearly this book escaped out of you when you were trying to not write it. But if we were to not leave things to chance anymore and just find the appropriate bribe to just keep you, what would it take? Well, I mean, to be honest, I think the literary people are just politely ignoring me. But, <laughs> um, but then I always think that's what the science fiction people do as well. Um, it's been interesting. It's been interesting doing a literary novel. Uh, you know, you do get taken more seriously in some respects. I'm sure you have that experience. Um, so you get invited to do BBC Radio which you don't really get when you write a book about robots, you know. Uh, you get invited to write for The Guardian, which, again, you don't really 
<laughs> you don't really get with the robots. You get a full page review instead of that little capsule sci-fi review because it's just a sci-fi book. But at the same time, I think science fiction has been interesting because it was always the genre where you could write about anything and no one would care because it was just science fiction. It was it had a silly cover on it, you know, it had a a weird cover and you could get away with anything and you could write about religion and you could write about politics, you could write about gender, you could write about anything you wanted and you would get away with it. And I think that's kind of the appeal of science fiction in a way. But also what I realize is after I've written my great big epic historical novel is that you, I kind of need the, the, the spaceships and the robots. I need... I need the weird stuff just as a break from it. It's grim. I spent the last year writing this epic family saga, which, you know, I've been boring you about for the past year. And I was so kind of stressed with it that I wrote about 12 science fiction short stories in between. Because I'd be like, you know, grim, 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 grim. Okay, robots for a bit. Um <laughs> So I don't see myself going anywhere. It would be nice to keep it. It would be nice to keep both. And I'm lucky enough that I have at least a publisher in the UK who seem happy to let me do the big, you know, literary fiction. And I have a publisher in the US who seem happy to let me do small, weird science fiction books. So it's kind of a nice position to be in. And so over the last few years, I remember, I mean, apart from your... Um, literary historical crime book um, and the science fiction and the fantasy. You also did the children's book not too long ago, books. Um, you did scripts, you did an animation film, you did a game, if I remember, or two. Um, so are you planning this or is it just happening? Like, how do you decide what to do next? And how many things are you doing at the same time? Like, how many open tabs are you running? on your internal uh, browser? Well, I closed all the tabs for this. I just had a whole bunch of tabs about Mars. I just thought <laughs> I might write something set on Mars. Um, no, I just kind of like messing about. I mean, how did you end up directing a film? <laughs> Would be a more interesting <laughs> question, I think. That, that was just a series of mistakes, right? But you do seem to be like the so I'm I'm jealous of I'm wildly jealous of writers who produce insane quality. And I'm also wildly jealous of writers who produce at insane pace. So it's compounded in your case. Um, but do you I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is um how far ahead do you broadly know what the next set of things is going to be? I mean, at the moment, because the way things worked, which is more about having backlog, you know, because most of the stuff takes me years and years to write. You know, I think a novel takes me about 10 years from conception to actually writing it to being published. Um, but I think because of the way things have lined up, I already have my, my next UK novel is coming out next year, which is the literary novel. My next US novel is coming out next year, which is sort of a novel about science fiction. Um, it's another weird one to describe. It's I basically it's called the circumference of the world, and it's basically what if L. Ron Hubbard discovered the secret of existence by accident or. Um, so it's kind of about the golden age of science fiction, but it kind of does some interesting literary stuff and it does some historical stuff, it does noir, it kind of combines several different genres. So I have those two novels kind of already scheduled for next year, plus, as you said, the best of all, the SF3, I think, should be out next year. And beyond that, I have the deal in the UK that they kind of said, well, you know, we would like these books, theoretically, and now I'm just kind of thinking, well, what do I want to do? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The animation has been fun. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just because a friend of mine started messing around with very crude animation. And I said, why don't I write you something? And maybe we can make this 
work beyond having some some pictures and that's been a lot of fun to do so um and the games i think i just taught myself to make mobile phone games because again lockdown you know what was there to do but no one really plays them um so that was kind of interesting but yeah i don't know i'm completely stuck right now i can't like i, I handed in my last novel a month ago and i've been stuck ever since so i have no idea what to do that's why i'm talking to you i have nothing better to do um, uh, i was wondering um so you know, through all of this, um, and this is always a this is always a strange question to to answer for any writer. But um, are you super conscious of how you know through working in in diverse media, diverse genres? Are you conscious of how your process has changed from when you started writing professionally? Like, do you are there things yeah, that you know you do? Fair. <laughs> Sorry, go on. No, no. So I was saying, are there like deliberate conscious changes in the way you approach writing now? Or are you more just following each story where it takes you like the robot with the flower? Yeah, I mean, writing Neon was actually really nice because it was so easy and, you know, effort free. It was really just a distraction. So I'd write short chapters and I'll just get through them. Um, I can never tell if a book is going to be the easiest thing to write or the hardest thing to write. I don't really enjoy the process. Like I enjoy writing short stories if I have an idea, but novels, I just, some novels I, I struggle with immensely. I think the violent century, that was a hellish book to write. Um, and then Osama was the, one of the easiest books ever to write. It was just so painless. Um, so I can never really tell. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I became lazier. <laughs> um, I think I'm more conscious of when I can do stuff or I can't or when to give myself a break. And um, But, yeah, I don't enjoy any of it. <laughs> don't enjoy it. <laughs> it's, I think, um, you know, I, was, I mean, I, I like doing it. I'm happy when something good comes out. Um, there are, but, but you know, I was writing this novel and it was, uh, you know, it was so grim. It was just, yeah. Like, and then I read through, it seems to be a good book. I can't really tell at this point. I'm kind of, you know, you finish it and you kind of, I, I hope it's a good book. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. No, but I still try and do as much as possible, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to move to some questions that have come in on chat now. Um, starting with, uh, what would your dream literary project be, given any amount of time or money necessary? Well, I mean, I still think you and I should be making that, uh, you know, writing that TV show that we <laughs> keep talking about. Yeah, except, um, except your idea of know, doing, doing this in Bollywood would just mean, like, you'd have to get that unlimited time and money in just to recover from it. Like, I, I don't know what the project would be like, but, but just speaking of books, like putting, putting aside our, uh, you know, our chaotic Bollywood future collaboration, um, just in terms of a dream book to write, if, if people just gave you huge amounts of money and time to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's not obviously. I have ideas, not not ones <laughs> I want to voice. I have this. I am. I am thinking of a book that is quite ambitious. I think in scope, I, I, it should be like this big, you know, instead of this big. Um, but I, but and that's a case of I wish someone gave me the money just so I could take the time to write it without stressing. But you know what? A lot of the time, I guess, if they did give us all the time in the world, we would just go to the beach. Yep. And we would never write the book. So <laughs> maybe it's good when they say, you have to write the book. You need to make, you need to get paid your next advance, you know, or else. Um, otherwise, because I mean, one thing I know is writers are incredibly lazy people. That's essentially why you're in the job. Cool. Yeah. Another question in the mm. chat is, uh, do you see science fiction being taken more seriously than decades prior? 
I mean, I tell you what it is, though, because I get I get to play, I get to wear different hats, you know. So I even got to be a comics guy for a bit, which was fun because I don't know anything about comics. Um, so I kind of have to nod politely when they mention comicsy stuff. Um, but you know, and I get to do these things. But occasionally, I get to be a science fiction writer. Um, where they invite you to something as a science fiction writer. And that's really interesting because people tend to take you seriously. They think you actually know what you're talking about because you wrote about it in a book. And you don't. And it's great. So, I mean, I think at some point I did, um, I did an academic conference in Cambridge on artificial intelligence. <laughs> I don't. We felt very intelligent. Um, and I got to go to China just before the pandemic started and actually went to an actual robotics lab. And so the actual robots people are building, you know, and it's scary. It's nothing to do with humanoid robots. It's stuff like tapeworm robots. You know, they're so creepy. It's unbelievable. Um, but you get to kind of go on stage and people ask you, what do you think about the future of the human race? Um, you know, <laughs> what do you think about moon colonization? I'm like, I don't know. I just make this stuff up. But I get to pretend. So occasionally some people will take it seriously. I think definitely the tech people kind of, you know, look to science fiction. I'm not sure that's a good thing, but that's yeah. kind of... You know, and as you know, all the, the big billionaires, they're like big sci-fi nerds, which is kind of disturbing in a way. Um, but yeah, I read there was one Silicon Valley company that literally said in the press release, we want to make the internet the way Levy wrote about in Central Station. Oh, no. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, was my, that was my reaction too. <laughs> Um, but, but it's nice to be. So it's, I think from nice that perspective. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, I think from that perspective. No, I think from that perspective, yes. But from the perspective of, say, the literary establishment, I'm not so sure. But, but you know, but then you kind of think, well, should they be taking more seriously? And also, isn't the point of science fiction not to be taken seriously? Um, that's kind of what gives it strength. Um, right. Um, okay. The next one is what books have you read or are, well, what books have you read recently and are currently reading and liked presumably? Well, I'm very glad I quit the uh, reviewing gig. So I don't have to read science fiction and fantasy for a bit. Other than as a, as an editor, obviously I read a lot of, um, short stories um so basically you know having done three and thought again i don't have copies of anything um having done these three massive anthologies now that is i think it's like just under six hundred thousand words I, I guess and so i read a lot of science fiction short stories from from around the world which is tends to be quite interesting but I'll tell you what, I'm completely addicted right now to the Slough House books. I don't know those. The, there's a TV, I think Apple just did a TV series based on it, Slow Horses. And it's basically about rubbish spies. Right. Um, it's kind of like John le Carre, if all the spies were just rubbish. That's the only way to describe it. They are so compulsively readable. It's unbelievable. It's, you know, um, nothing supernatural about them, but just, you know, the incompetence and the, the sheer luck and the mess of it. And it's just, they're fantastic. So I'm kind of addicted. I'm, I'm like, I've got to finish this one so I can get on to the next one. And there's eight of them. So I'm very excited. But I still have four to go. What are you reading? Um... Well, the last book I read was, of course, Neom. Apart from that, I'm reading a bunch of uh, nonfiction stuff that I've been uh, kind of planning to for general 
brain improvement purposes. I was just reading the giant, uh, the Merlin Sheldrake book on funguses that people have been raving to me about uh, for the last two, three years. It's called An Entangled Life, I think, or, or something similar. Um, which is, well, it's, it's massive and it's about funguses and it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, but I suspect, I suspect that a lot of the people who were recommending it to me haven't actually read it themselves. Um, and now I'm going to, I'm going to test and see whether they remember specific bits of it. Um, apart from that, I think off that, I read, uh, I, I'm, st I'm reading a bunch of dark academia books, which is, which is a whole space that I knew nothing about before. But I read uh, Rebecca Kwong's Babel and really enjoyed it. So I'm I'm doing more in that. But I've been reading less because I've been working on a Bollywood superhero vanity project. And that clears the brain out so much that you can't really process books uh, to, to a large extent. But that's why. Yeah, no, you know, I'm a big fan of your uh, your Bollywood superhero vanity project. So. <laughs> Very excited for that one. It gives me, um, it gives me, I, actually, relevance. I picked yeah. up, <laughs> no, I picked up an encyclopedia of uh, poisonous mushrooms a while back. Um, don't test me on it. I only looked at the I, I preface won't. and it literally said the most, the most poisonous mushrooms in the world are the ones grown in Chernobyl because <laughs> they're literally radioactive. And I thought, if you couldn't make a murder mystery out of that, I don't know what, what you would. Uh, that's just amazing to me. Radioactive fungus. Um, but, yeah. There's another nice that's one here, which is, um, how does writing in multiple genres help or hinder your writing process when you work on projects? Well, I mean, I get distracted easily, so it's quite nice to be doing different things because if you're bored with one thing, you go to another one. I think it's only when I'm writing a novel when I'm in full flow, I, I can't focus on anything else, but usually I will do a chunk of something and then I'll go and do something else just almost to clear the, the mind. And then December always tends to be kind of a quiet month, so... I think last year I ended up writing a, a, a French style graphic novel for my artist just because it was December. There wasn't much to do. So I was like, yeah, I'll write, I'll write you a graphic novel and maybe you maybe I'll even do it one one day. You know, I thought it wasn't. I said, I'll I'll write you whatever it is you want to, to draw. So, you know, what do you want to draw? Like what do you like? And he's like, well, space stuff and Lovecraft. And I uh, think like cyberpunk. I was like, right, so let's do something that has like space stuff in Lovecraft and cyberpunk. Um, but that was kind of a fun thing to do. So, yeah, you know, I'll try and do as much as I can because I'm kind of restless. So it's always nice. And also, as I discovered this year, um, as, a, as you've discovered a long time ago, you know, film and TV money is so much better than books. And that um, once you have it, you kind of keep thinking, well, how do I get a little bit more of that? You know, I just want another little taste. Um, and that's bad. I, I don't think that's a good thing for writers because you get sucked into it because the money is good and then no one ever hears from you again. Yeah. Um, so I've always tried to resist the, the, the call of the film and TV industry. But now that I'm also, you know, a certified writer of the weirdest animation on the planet um yeah which is just a side hustle so yeah basically you know whatever is interesting i'll do it yeah i mean i've i've certainly um not written books for years because i got sucked into the world of tv and film but the nice thing is that you burn out so hard that you kind of bounce back and you remember that you really enjoy writing books in ways that um, you know, that TV and film, while fun and entertaining and all of that, just cannot give you. So even if you even if you disappear down that dark road, I'm pretty sure you will <laughs> end up writing a, another science fiction book that you didn't mean to write at the time. <laughs> Everything will be fine. 
think we have yeah, some that's true i mean i did want to write more children's books um you know and i might actually be doing another children's book um next year which is just kind of an interesting thing um that was just literally just coming up with the idea and then trying to see if anyone would publish it and i think they are but um but after i wrote candy i tried to write another children's book one summer like middle grade stuff and i can't you know and the idea was that there's this global pandemic type thing that um only really kills grown-ups but children aren't really harmed by it so the all the children get put into like a big quarantine zone you know, and my working title for it was quarantine, which I thought was a fun, ridiculous concept. You know? <laughs> and what what year was this? <laughs> well, this 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 was about a year before the pandemic. It went on submission right. two weeks before COVID hit. So yeah. you never saw so many editors just run away from a book so quickly. And I was like, really, of all the things I could have picked, it was quarantine. Mm. I mean, you know. You can see why no one wanted to publish it. So I'm basically waiting now for everyone to either forget there was a pandemic or for all those editors to just, you know, get a better job somewhere else. And I'll try again because it was a really fun book. But that was the one example of a book where I thought, I really wish I didn't waste that summer writing this entirely unsellable book. But in my defense, I had no idea that that was actually going to happen. So, and are you, you're also doing a sequel to Maror, are you not? Well, it's not a sequel, um, no, but it's it's the, it's the next book in the sort of weird, it's kind of like literary, historical, noir-ish sort of thing. So um the next one is basically following four generations of a particularly unpleasant family to be honest um and how i mean the way i pitch it is that it's about four generations of this terrible family and how they all die essentially um but it's been it's been an interesting one to write so it follows more insofar as it's set it starts in about 1946 and it goes on until 2009. So it is quite a large breadth of history. And again, it's kind of based very closely on historical research. Um, this one is mostly set on a kibbutz in Israel. So it kind of shows how it starts and how it changes and how everyone dies horribly and people keep people chained up in cellars. Um, I may have been leaning a little hard into the Gothic with that one, you know, but... Um, but a lot of it was interesting. A lot of it was research that I didn't, um, I, I didn't know. A lot of it was quite interesting. So it's really interesting to see how, again, the country changes. And I guess the idea is the next one would go even further back in time. So we would go back to the 19th century when it's the Ottoman Empire and the coming of the British Empire and this sort of real Wild West thing that was going on. It, it's fascinating stuff, but... But then every time I think about it, I start looking at the research involved. <laughs> just thinking, oh, I, I just, I can't start it, you know, it's, but it's a, it's a really interesting period. So um, I now want you to put on that uh, science fiction futurist writer serious hat and uh, predict what's going to happen in uh, publishing over the next decade. God, can it get any worse publishing? I mean, I have no idea. I only know about stuff that happens about 400 years from now, you know, because that's easy, because everyone's going to be dead by the time they figure out if you're right or wrong about it. I have no idea. It's a real struggle, isn't it? And I mean, you and I are from those people who kind of kept at it and have pushed to get our books out there. And it doesn't feel like it's ever getting any easier. I mean, that was my thinking was sort of like, surely it must get easy at some point. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't, it, it's just, um, but the people I feel really bad for, the people who are starting out because 
selling a, selling a debut novel is the easy part at the moment, isn't it? You sell a book, you don't have a sell sell record. Everyone's very excited, and and I saw it in the PR that I was getting as a as a reviewer. It was, you know, the number one debut that everyone was waiting for. And then the next one that everyone was waiting for. And then the next one that everyone was waiting for. And according to the PR emails, everyone has been waiting for all these books that I never heard of. Um, and you know for a fact that once they don't become huge best overnight sellers, they won't get another book deal. And the churn is just insane. So it's almost about if you can get through the first three books... You know, if you can land another book after that, then you're pretty much guaranteed to stick around just because, you know, everyone's given up on you. And I think partly, I always think of it as, you know, I'm cheap. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can keep me around. I'm cheap. I, I, won't cost, I won't cost you much, and you might pick up an award if you're lucky, you know, once in a blue moon. Um, but it's really, really hard, and I don't think it does a great service to readers i don't think it does a great service to authors i'd love to see some more publishers just doing books because they're interesting rather than because of the sales and then of course you don't sound like someone in publishing because it's all about the sales um, everyone will tell you it's a business but no one knows what sells so why don't you just do some weird books and maybe you know they will you will get lucky and i've seen it a few times i've seen books that i was asked to blurb because they figured no one is going to buy this book <laughs> and they became <laughs> huge, you know. Um, and I also didn't figure anyone would buy them. <laughs> so <laughs> that was uh, um, frustrating. So you never know. So I'm like, why don't you just, you know, we need to kind of break, if you could break down that corporate, you know, structure that you gave people back a bit of autonomy to just do interesting stuff. You might lose money, but you might lose money on whatever you publish. And also, I would love to see some long-term support for, for authors to say, you know, we, we'll take your next four books. We'll give you that opportunity to, to write. And that's kind of, kind of what I have in the UK, amazingly, is that they said, yes, how many books do you want to do? There's a contract. Go and write them, whatever they are, you know. I mean, and I'm like, but no publisher does that. No publisher has ever said to me, go and write whatever you want and we'll publish it. Uh, and we need, I think we need a little bit more of that. Yeah, because I mean, especially as the the lags between writing a book and it coming out in the world get longer and longer. I mean, this this period of, of at least a degree of support is going to become even more crucial. And I also just do not see people getting it. Like it's big splashy debut or or nothing or kind of survive in the wilderness. Well, hopefully. I think, I mean, I, you know, ultimately I think the people who are going to stick around are going to stick around, you know. Um, those, if you're good enough and if you're, if you're annoying enough, I always think. <laughs> if you're just going to make yourself enough of a pain in the ass that they just have to, you know, they have to deal with you. Um, even though, you know, you get the sense that no, you know, and I, it's so frustrating. I mean, I think as long as you realize it never gets any easier and you just have to make yourself enough of a pain. I think that's the most inspirational <laughs> thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Speaking Welcome of back. pain, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us for today's event. Um, thank you so much, Lavi, for being here and celebrating the release of Neom and speaking more with us. Uh, Summit, thank you so much for being here and being a wonderful conversation partner. Thank um, you. Lastly, before we go, I just want to make sure for both of you, where can people follow you on social media so they can keep up with what you're doing next? That's uh, isn't that opening a whole can of worms right now? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you, know, you can find me on Twitter unless you know, unless who knows, <laughs> as long as Twitter is still there, as long as blue ticks aren't sold on the black market from Mars, uh, that's fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, 
Yeah, no, but Are I'm you... I'm Levitid at Twitter. Oh, I, I was last time I checked. Again, I can't <laughs> speak for what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm also Samit Basu on all the things that are still around <laughs> as, as of this moment. And thank you everyone for again for tuning in. Uh, if you're watching this live right now, you can still click the link below at any time. Uh, get Neom or any one of Lovey's uh, previous books that we still have available. Um, you can also get Samit's book on there too, which last year or we're still in 2022, which yeah, was a <laughs> which was a um, a book crate pick for our sci-fi and fantasy for one of our months. So we we greatly enjoyed his book, and we hope you do too. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you both for being here. Crazy days of the time. I wish everyone a great day. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.